passing of time provides us the advantage of perspective, to see things more clearly, to mark the moments that shape the future. The history of Ohio State football is filled with a grand collection of glorious moments of games, players, and coaches that have changed the face of college football. The 1968 game against number one Purdue was one of those moments. This is that story. Ohio State's 1968 victory over top-ranked Purdue is perhaps the greatest win in the history of Ohio State football. When we left that field after winning that game, I don't think anybody knew whether their feet were touching the ground or not. That was the greatest feeling that I've ever had. People were so happy. They were just rejoicing. They were talking with each other. Strangers were talking with strangers. I've never felt a crowd like this crowd. It seemed to me they were standing the entire game. It was like uh, probably a 10 on a Richter scale. And this is the preseason rated number one team. They've got Leroy Keyes. They got Mike Phipps, and at that time, they had a monstrous offensive and defensive line. This game defined everything for us. It, it gave us our identity. You know, you just, it was just a special day. The win was a springboard to the national championship and to a season that still reverberates in the hearts of Buckeye fans everywhere. It was also the beginning of a new era of excellence, a period which saw the Buckeyes win nine Big Ten titles in 10 years with some of college football's greatest players. But the championship age born that day was never assured. In fact, just one year before, the Buckeyes were in disarray, and Coach Woody Hayes was under fire. Now, there was a 13-game period there from 1966 through the first part of 1967, where in those 13 games, Ohio State lost eight of those games. In fact, of those eight losses, four of those losses were four straight losses at home. And Woody Hayes is in a little bit of trouble. There was a lot of pressure and a lot of criticism about Woody, uh, even to the point that the game had passed him by and uh, the planes would fly around the stadium, bye-bye Woody. And we always assumed that Woody was above anything, that, that Woody was beyond being touched. You know? uh, but we, you couldn't ignore the signs. That was difficult, and especially to have the banners and people singing and chanting, goodbye Woody, we hate to see you go. That was not... Well, it's not fair. It got to the point in, in, late in 66 and early in 67 season. I, I can't go into the details. It was so bad. It was the best thing. It was ugly. The flagging Buckeye fortunes were the result of a controversial 1961 vote by the university's faculty council that prevented the Big Ten champion Buckeyes from going to the Rose Bowl. That decision by the Ohio State Faculty Council to vote down going to the Rose Bowl, there's no question that really unfavorably affected uh, Hayes' ability to recruit in the state of Ohio. It did hurt recruiting because there were coaches around the Big Ten who would say you don't want to go to Ohio State because uh, you never know whether they, if they win the Big Ten whether they're going to be able to go to the Rose Bowl or not because of the feeling between the faculty and the athletic department. By 1966, the fallout from the Rose Bowl vote was felt on the field and the Buckeyes limped to a 4-5 and five record. Only the second losing season in 15 years for Coach Hayes. Woody realized a new approach was needed to lure top flight talent to Columbus. Hayes changes his strategy, and that is he's going to recruit on much more of a national basis. Well, that produced tremendous results in the 1967 freshman team. Players like uh, Jack Tatum, uh, John Brockington, Bruce Jankowski, uh, Timmy Anderson, all brought in from other states to become part of what a lot of people consider maybe the greatest freshman team ever assembled. You could go across the line through the backfield offense and defense, and there were all Ohioans, uh, uh, high school All-Americans at almost, uh, almost every position. It was kind of being built up. And so we had a lot of credibility coming into 1967, and there was a lot of excitement. You can read the press clippings and the guys, you know, and look into a guy's eye and see uh, just as well as I can. You know, if you've got the look of Eagles, you know, you're going, ha ha, oh yeah, we got something here. But in 1967, freshmen were ineligible to play varsity football, and that excitement was put on hold. In the meantime, the 67 Buckeyes were off to a terrible start. Purdue really beat us badly. And then we had the homecoming game with Illinois, and we lost. And at that point in the season, we were two and three. And you don't lose to Illinois, you don't lose at home. Obviously, you don't lose the homecoming game. The rounding defeats made fans restless. 
and the calls for Woody's job grew louder. In 1967, they were hanging Woody in effigy at the corner of 15th and High. If you don't win at Ohio State, you're going to have plenty of heat, and you're going to have airplanes flying around the stadium, and you're going to have all kinds of stuff like that. I remember Ann Hayes carrying a goodbye Woody sign. I'm thinking, wow, this is pretty tough. You know, the guy's wife is saying goodbye. With his program teetering on the brink of collapse, Woody dug in. Hayes called his staff together after the fifth game and pretty well told them that if we win out, we probably have a pretty good chance of keeping our job. But if the season continues, he felt there was a good chance that he would be relieved of his coaching position and that probably most of the assistants would need to find some jobs elsewhere. The next week we went to Michigan State. We won up there. And after the game, I remember Coach Hayes uh, coming into the locker room and saying this was the most important game of his coaching career. And we knew then uh, his, his job was probably on the line. Ohio State went on to win the rest of their games, including a 24-14 win over Michigan. But the early season losses, especially to Purdue, lingered in the hearts of the team. We sat in the, in the stands and watched that Purdue game as freshmen when they came in into our house and beat us 41 to 6. I still remember the score because I had never been a, a part of a game in my career that was that lopsided. That was a bad day. I remember going into the locker room and our quarterback coach jumped in my face and he said, Rex, remember about this game. He said, that's what we're playing for next year. And he said, don't let that ever, ever happen to us again and don't get embarrassed like that in that stadium. Redemption was one year away. The 1968 Ohio State football season opened with victories over SMU and Oregon. In the starting lineup were 14 sophomores from Woody Hayes' heralded 1967 recruiting class. Their much anticipated arrival and raised the hopes of the Buckeye faithful. With the recruiting class that Woody had in 1968, even the, even the doubting Thomases were beginning to say, here's a team that could go all the way because he had the greatest alignment of talent for that 1968 season that I think they've ever had at one time at Ohio State University. But that optimism and the players who created it were about to face their first real test. The Purdue Boilermakers, the nation's number one team, Purdue arrived in Columbus led by two of the game's most exciting players, All-American quarterback Mike Phipps and running back Leroy Keyes, the preseason favorite for the Heisman Trophy. Just one year earlier, Purdue had pummeled the Buckeyes 41-6 in the horseshoe, and most fans felt the promising but unproven sophomores were still a year away. Oddsmakers agreed and rated the Boilermakers a 13-point favorite, a role they relished. Purdue was talking, they were talking a lot of trash. Leroy Keyes, great athlete, said when he went back after that game, they beat him real bad, that he didn't even feel like he was in a football game. He had been quoted as saying he didn't think there was anybody in college football that could cover him one-on-one. -on -one. We felt that this was a different football team. We had some defensive backs. We had a guy in Jack Tatum that could cover anybody in the country. So we were confident going into the game that, hey, this is a different football team, this is a different day, and uh, you're on our home turf, and we like to play in the horse. The Buckeyes were determined to prove that difference right from the start. Woody felt that the Purdue linemen were slow and out of shape, and we went with no huddle offense on the first series we had the ball. We were calling plays in huddle three at a time, and we were just running right at them. John Brockington's second down sprint around left end set the tone immediately. Their fast-paced opening drive took them deep inside Purdue territory. But when the drive stalled at the Boilermaker 4, the field goal team came in. The ball is towed down, the kick is up, and it is no good, wide to the right, and that could be an important miss. Erratic kicking, a season-long nemesis, would plague the Buckeyes the rest of the day. But Ohio State's opening drive sent the Boilers a clear message, you're in for a game. It also showcased Woody's willingness to add new wrinkles, something his assistants had pushed for in the offseason. That spring, they changed the entire offense. Uh, we, we went to a slot-eye offense in 68 that was nothing like Woody ever had. I mean, it was really counter football to 
uh, what the highest state has been known for. We spread the field, threw the ball, spread it out, used sideline to sideline. It really caught a lot of people by surprise. The changes were proposed by quarterbacks coach George Champ, whose ideas initially found resistance. There's a few stories about the assistant coaches fighting with Woody about changing the offense, and there's projectors flying through meeting room windows and, and coaches getting fired uh, because they're trying, they're arguing their point about it. And then Woody calms down and calls the coaches back, and, and they talk about it a little bit more, and, and then Woody, uh, as the story goes, he'll, damn it, we'll, damn it, we'll, we'll, we'll give it a try. It was different and it was exciting. It, uh, proved that the coach wasn't closed-minded, that he'd take a good suggestion from wherever it came. It was an outstanding offense, and uh, the old man did warm up to it. That optimism was infectious, and the team quickly became believers. During practice, you could start seeing some things happen and uh, start developing an attitude that, uh, hey, we can win. We can win against anybody we come up against. We got a lot of weapons here. We got a lot of tools. It was just a different spirit about that whole team, and, uh, and, and I think in the coaching staff, too. The new look, new attitude Buckeyes were now looking to settle old scores. The new style offense had the Boilermakers on their heels, but critical errors kept the Buckeyes off the scoreboard. Passes sailed high, field goals strayed wide. When the half ended, the teams were tied at zero. But inside the locker room, the Buckeyes' spirits were high. Woody didn't really have to give us a pep talk there at halftime. We probably didn't want to go in at halftime. We wanted to keep playing. We felt like we were ahead of the game because last year was, who knows, 38 nothing. I can't remember at halftime. It was horrible. It was not that we're hanging with these guys. Hey, we're beating them. We got them on the run, guys. We just need to put the ball in the end zone. To bring down the Boilermakers, the Buckeyes needed a big play. The game's big break was just minutes away. As the second half of the 1968 Ohio State-Purdue game kicked off, the young upstart Buckeyes looked to break the deadlock of a scoreless first half. The turning point came quickly. On the fourth play of the third quarter, one of the most memorable plays in all of Ohio State football uh, was about to happen. Formation. Again, Phipps going back to throw. He has time. He throws. It's intercepted by Tobos, and he's going in for touchdown. Touchdown, Ohio. Tobos scores. The stadium erupted. The bench erupted. That was enough for us to win the football game. Tobos intercepted the pass on about the 30-yard line. That was it. It was a tremendous boost. I mean, uh, that stadium uh, was was just moving. I don't, think it, I don't think it stopped all season. The play was the result of a special defensive scheme installed weeks before just for Purdue. We had a special defense where, uh, and they left it to me and Pro Bowls. We could call it when we wanted to. And uh, it was called Robert, and Teddy and I would just exchange positions on uh, certain plays, and we'd do it at the snap of the ball. Well, the second play of the second half, they threw the outcut, and I want to tell you, Jack Tatum had that sucker in his hand, and he drops it. At the next play, we called the regular defense, and he was thinking we were going to run the same defense, so he made the throw, and Teddy just stepped in it perfectly and just took it in. Basically, you dream about this stuff, getting that flat pass where, you know, nobody's in front of you and just straight down the sideline. It just happened to be the play we were looking for. And they mob Provo's down there. That uh, kind of turned the game around right there. Two series later, the Buckeye defense did it again. And they've spread them out all over the field as Phipps goes back to throw. He throws it, and it's intercepted by Ohio. Still wagon. Still wagon intercepts. Jim Stillwagon. From the Purdue 25, the Buckeye offense went to work. Three carries by fullback Jim Otis moves the ball to the Purdue 8. A Buckeye touchdown seems certain, but then disaster struck. And it's Kern sweeping wide to his right, but he can't do it. They catch him from behind. And Kern is a little slow getting up. And there are a couple of big guys coming in there on Rex, and Rex was obviously shaken up. With Kern on the sideline, Woody faced a decision. Should he put in second-teamer Ron Masajowski, just a sophomore, or go with senior Billy Long, 
the starting quarterback the previous two seasons. Woody opted for experience and called Long's number, much to the crowd's dismay. There was a large contingent of booing when I came in that game. They wanted Mason Jowski, understandably. We were all surprised to see Bill Long come in, too. But I guess Woody wanted a guy that he felt could go right in there and just feel at home. We all had trepidation when he came in. We did. We just thought, oh boy, this is its curtains. Faced with the third and goal, the record crowd of over 85,000 watched Billy Long make his run into Buckeye lore. In the third period, a tight T. Billy Long, the quarterback. Billy Long going back to throw. He's looking now. Now he decides to run. He's at the 10, the 5, the 4. He's in. He scores. Billy Long scores for Ohio. A 14-yard touchdown run. Here was a guy that had set passing records the two previous years and wound up when the season started as the third string quarterback. It was a tough time for me up to that moment in, in this year. And I did feel, uh, I, in retrospect, I, I like to call it a more sense of belonging, you know, because I was feeling isolated at that point. And then this made me feel, you know, really now part of this team and a little bit of a sense of, of vindication. I think that was the greatest highlight of his life right there. You could tell when he came out the field. <laughs> his big smile on his face. To cap off the excitement, the Buckeyes converted the extra point, their only successful kick of the day. Momentum was now completely with the Buckeyes, but there was still over a quarter to play. But there was still, believe me, a sense this game wasn't over. This was still the third quarter, and we were playing against the number one offensive team in the country. The Buckeye defense, already smothering, turned up the volume. The defense was, I mean, they were whacking people. The whooping that they took last year, they was giving it back. Jack Tatum in particular was a force. Given the assignment of shadowing Leroy Keyes, Tatum responded with an historic effort. And I think anybody that was in Ohio Stadium that day or saw that game on television will never, ever forget the play of Jack Tatum. If Leroy Keyes is super, Jack Tatum is a super, super. He <laughs> was the greatest football player I've ever seen. When Tatum took two steps, he was in full stride. When he hit you, he ran through you. He ran over you. It was like a, a, a Mack truck hit me. Tatum's climax came in the fourth quarter, when his sack of Mike Phipps sent the Purdue All-American to the bench. With Phipps out of the game and keys shut down, all that remained was the sound two, of the final gun. One. And the ball game is over. Ohio wins it, 13 to nothing. The biggest upset of the season. The Buckeyes win it, defeating the Boilermakers of Purdue. And there's pandemonium going on on the field. They're coming out of the stands. They're coming off the bench. After that game and beating the number one team, we knew we were on our way. We knew then that uh, all we had to do was perform as we did here. Practice like we did to get ready for this game. And every game that we'd have, nobody could touch us. The victory over Purdue was a watershed event in the course of Buckeye history. It was a launching pad to the national championship and a vindication for coach Woody Hayes. It was a game for the ages and a turning point for a team playing in troubled times. It was also the birth of a new era, an age of excellence and excitement that has endured for over 30 years an era whose end is not in sight. Woody Hayes was known as a fiery, emotional leader who would stop at nothing to gain an edge. In the 1968 battle against Purdue, Hayes enlisted the services of Marine Commander General Lewis Walt to give his team a halftime pep talk. Now, did the General's words inspire the Buckeyes to victory? Probably not. For even Woody knew that no amount of shouting could ever replace the three components it takes to win. Blocking, tackling, and execution. For Buckeye Classics, I'm Archie Griffin. Thanks for watching.